It's got Nick Sonic on it. 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 Hey everybody, I am so happy to finally be back with you for another video today. If you uh, are new to this channel, my name is Diana and I'm a knitwear designer and teacher living in Montreal. Um, you can follow me on Instagram as Cake and Vikings and I'm on Ravelry as Diana Walla. We also have a Ravelry group for Paper Tiger for my patterns and also for this channel. Uh, and I will post links to all of that in the description box just down below. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite things, which is books. I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite books about stranded color work. Um, I wouldn't call all of these reference books. Some of them do contain knitting patterns, but the thing that they have in common is they are all about stranded color work in some way. So instead of just being pattern books or that kind of thing, um, they go into, they give you a little bit more depth of information, whether that's historical information or context or inspiration or something else entirely. Um, some of these books are books that I've used when preparing to teach classes on specific regional techniques or traditions, for example. I'll be listing every book that I talk about in the description box below as well, and those notes will be timestamped. So if you're actually interested in hearing just about one specific book, you can see if it's on that list and you can click on the timestamp itself to take you to that point in the video. Um, there are also going to be links to the author's websites or places you can purchase the book, relevant information like that. My goal with this video is to share some of my favorite books with you, so I'm going to try and give you some useful information for each book. Um, I'll let you know whether the book has patterns or not. I'm going to try and let you know if there are translations available. Some of these books do have translations available, but I, uh, I might miss some of the ones that are out there. So if you know this book's been translated into your native language and it's not English, feel free to leave that in the comments. Um, I just want to give you as much information as possible as you can use, um, and do feel free to ask questions in the comments as well. I'll do my best to stay on top of those and answer any questions that come up that I know the answers to. Now before I get started, I have a small disclaimer. This is by no means a comprehensive list of colorwork books. This is just me sharing a few of my personal favorites with you all. Um, so it may not be the most balanced list of books you've ever seen. If you're already familiar with me or my work, you know that uh, I have a particular interest in Norwegian colorwork. So this, this collection of books is a little Norway heavy, for example. Um, so if there's books I don't talk about that you love that are about colorwork traditions, Please share that in the comments as well because I always love learning about new books and then everybody else can um, share in that knowledge as well. I also want to acknowledge that several of these authors are people who are friends or colleagues of mine, um, but I did purchase all of these books myself and I wouldn't recommend them if I didn't genuinely love them. I just wanted to acknowledge that. But without further ado, let's start talking about the books. I'm actually going to kick us off by talking about a few stitch dictionaries. I love stitch dictionaries, and most general stitch dictionaries do include some stranded colorwork patterns, but what I really love is a stitch dictionary that is only stranded colorwork. So this one is called Alternate. Um, it's by Andrea Rangel, who's a knitwear designer based out of British Columbia in Canada. Um, I'm a big fan of Andrea's, and the, I think the story of how this book came about is a really cool one. So Alternate is a stitch dictionary of stranded colorwork motifs, but what really sets it apart is the fact that the book was a collaborative effort between Andrea and her husband, Sean. Um, while Andrea is a knitwear designer, Sean's background is in fine art. Um, and while he can knit, he doesn't do it often. But for this book, they drew on a process that they have used before um, in the past for designs of Andrea's where um, Sean will come up with a motif or draw a chart and Andrea will knit it up. So I feel like that process means that there's a lot of innovative and unusual motifs in this book. Um, and the overarching idea is definitely to help knitters sort of broaden their horizons when it comes to stranded color work and sort of, it's an incentive to be creative. So I'm holding this over on the edge of the frame so that you can't actually see the charts, but you can see the swatches that Andreas knit. There's a lot of um, very sort of abstract geometric types of motifs in here. Here's a few more examples of that kind of thing. Here on top is one of the more unusual motifs. This one is called Brains, and those are zombies. So for me, this book has a lot of creative potential. Um, it also has five knitting patterns in the back that are sort of intended to be a jumping off point for figuring out how to swap out motifs and pick something that you want to use in a piece of knitting. Um, 
uh, to use your own charts and just bring more creativity to your knitting. So Andrea provides some guidance on how to do that. And the beginning of the book also has some technical information for, um, you know, that's helpful for color work knitting. So information about choosing colors, how to hold your yarns. She doesn't just say there's one way because there's lots of ways. Um, how to tension your floats, things like that. She also talks about color dominance. So I think this one's just a really fantastic and fun resource. Um, this book has been translated into many languages. I know it's over 10, but a few of the examples are Italian, Russian, Chinese, Norwegian, and Japanese. I got to see the Norwegian edition when I was in Norway in September, and that was quite fun. So um, yeah, Alternate by Andrea Rangel. Next up, I'm going to talk about a couple of stitch dictionaries from Mary Jane Mucklestone. And if you've ever had the good fortune to take a class with Mary Jane, you'll be familiar with these. Um, Mary Jane is a wonderful knitwear designer who's definitely known for her playful stranded color work patterns. First up is 200 Varial Motifs with a relatively self-explanatory title. Um, this book was first published in 2011 and it deals specifically with stranded motifs found in Varal knitting from Shetland. So we're talking about a particular regional tradition. Um, there's about 30 pages of background information at the front of the book before you get into the motifs. But for me, the motifs are really the main reason for buying this book. Uh, the way Mary Jane organizes them is part of why that's true. It's incredibly, incredibly useful. So first, there's a section called the motif selector, where you can see the motifs at a glance. Each motif is numbered 1 through 200 with a page number given, if you want to go and see the chart for it. And then the motifs are organized by row count in this book. So you start with one row of motifs and you move on to two rows and three rows and so on and so forth, all the way up to, I want to say, maybe 19 rows, maybe bigger. 19 rows is right. So with this motif selector at the front, I think it's very easy to browse for what you're looking for. Um, and it's very easy to see the stitch count and the row count for each motif once you go to that page. So as a designer, I find that absolutely invaluable. Um, and as a knitter, it means it's very easy to substitute different motifs in your own projects. So I'll give you an example of what that looks like. We'll pick a simple motif. I'm getting a quick glimpse. You can see here that you've got four rows by two stitches. You can see that very easily at a glance. And the thing that's nice too about this, you have these colorful swatches, but Mary Jane gives you the charts in black and white in color using the colors shown in the swatch, but also a color variation to help you visualize what it might look like in different colors. Um, it's just a really incredible resource. Mary Jane's other stitch dictionary, 150 Scandinavian motifs, is very similar, but it has a few differences. Firstly, there are obviously fewer motifs in total, although even though it says 150, there's 168 motifs in here. Um, it has the same format, more or less. So you have technical information at the beginning, you have a motif selector, and then you have the charts following. But the motifs are not laid out in the same way as in the Pharaoh book. So you aren't going by row count, for example. They're sort of all mixed up. But where the first one, 200 Pharaoh motifs, does not have any patterns in it, it's just a sti stitch dictionary, um, 150 Scandinavian motifs does have uh, four patterns at the back of the book using some of these motifs. Both of these books have been translated into languages other than English. Um, I don't have a list of translated versions, but if you are interested in it and English isn't your native language, but you want to have that technical information up front, it's worth checking to see if they're available. The next book I'm going to tell you about is very, very special. In March of 2016, I went to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival and I had the opportunity to hear Susan Crawford give a talk about a book project she'd been working on called the Vintage Shetland Project. Susan, as a knitwear designer, was already known as someone who took sort of vintage knitwear and vintage patterns and uh, overhauled them in order to make them more accessible to a modern knitting audience. Um, you can see that in her previous books, A Stitch in Time, Volumes 1 and 2. Um, the Vintage Shetland Project took the same idea, but with um, knitwear pieces from the Shetland Museum's archive. So at that point in 2016, Susan had already been working on this project for six years. At the festival, I had the opportunity to see the samples in person and talk to Susan herself, and that was incredibly exciting for me. I was very, very much looking forward to this project coming to fruition. Uh, but a few months later, Susan was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
And the book got put on hold for 18 months. Susan is in remission now. I'll go ahead and say that, thankfully. Um, we're all so grateful. Uh, and I'll come back to all of that in a minute. But the book finally came out earlier this year. And I would I want to talk about the book first. Um, I'm doing my best to like talk clearly about this book, but it makes me a little bit emotional. So <laughs> please forgive me. This is the Vintage Shetland Project. This hefty tome weighs in at nearly five pounds. It's close to 500 pages long, and it is so, so beautiful. It is a magnum opus. Um, it's the culmination of eight years of nearly all-consuming work. It's both beautifully and thoughtfully designed. It's meticulously researched. Um, I have so many good things to say about it. It was done, this project, in collaboration with the Shetland Museum, who gave Susan the opportunity to visit and um, pick a selection of pieces from the archive in order to recreate them. Um, so she documented every inch of every garment um, and wrote patterns for them, basically. I can't even wrap my head around it. Um, Susan deliberately chose pieces that were unique in some way. So these were pieces that were not knit from patterns originally. These were maybe things that had been entered into competitions or um, they were made by very skilled knitters and they were reflective of the fashions at the time or it's someone's life story or they had some kind of deeper meaning in some way. Um, Susan's gathered a really interesting collection of pieces in this book. So while those physical pieces are preserved in the Shetland Museum archive, um, Susan wanted to document them on paper and preserve them in that form for posterity because even in a museum setting, textile artifacts will eventually break down and disappear from the world. Um, but this means that they can live beyond that. So one of the challenges in putting together a book like this is translating the motifs from the knitwear pieces themselves to the printed page. Um, in a sort of timely fashion or manner. Um, so Susan and her husband Gavin developed a computer program that would allow them to transcribe these patterns quickly and efficiently. Um, Susan graded each pattern for a variety of sizes so that they are accessible patterns for modern knitters now, even though the original pieces were only ever, you know, they're one of a kind, it's only one size. She's done the work for all of us of different sizes to be able to make them for ourselves. Um, each piece chosen from the archive was recreated um, very with very much care and attention to detail. And then for the book, those new samples were photographed in Shetland. So while this book has these patterns for these 27 pieces, it doesn't just have that. It also tells the story of them. The first 90 pages of this book are made up of essays written by Susan where her incredible research is on display for all of us to share in. Um, it's absolutely staggering. And that's where I mean that the book has been meticulously researched. Um, I enjoyed reading the essays so, so much. The garments Susan chose are all from the first half of the 20th century, which is her area of expertise in fashion history. Um, but there's so much more history woven into the stories of the garments and accessories that she chose. And it's just fascinating to read about. I've learned so much about the state of knitting in Shetland in the first half of the 20th century. So like I said, there's 27 patterns in total. 19 of those are Fair Isle, or stranded color work. Um, six pieces are lace. One has beads, it's a beaded piece, and one combines stranded color work and intarsia. That one's really cool. Um, so after the initial essay section, that's the beginning of the book, there's a sort of gallery, and that's where you see photos of the finished pieces all together, um, and then you can reference the page of the actual pattern. So the patterns come at the very back of the book. I have several favorites <laughs> among the patterns already, and I have yarn set aside for a Yule sweater. Here, I can find it and show you. This is Yule. And that's, uh, it was based on a sweater that belonged to a man, so you see it on a male model, but also on a female model. And that's actually Susan's daughter. Um, I cannot stress how absolutely stunning the photography in this book is. Um, Susan did an incredible job, and it's almost worth it for the gallery section alone add to it the patterns and the essays and all of it and it's just I mean it's like I said at the beginning it's a very very special book a few more of my favorites this is Vela modeled by the incredible Ella Gordon this 
Suffragette is the incredible piece I was talking about that combines stranded color work and intarsia. The Marianne cardigan is one of the lace pieces and it's absolutely stunning. I think I might make that one as well. And one of the things that I enjoyed talking to Susan about at her talk was some of the links between Shetland knitting and Norwegian knitting. Um, which I could see in some of the pieces she had chosen, like these gloves. And if you know anything about Norwegian knitting, you'll notice that they look very much like they come from the Selbuvåta tradition. Um, and particularly during World, World War II, there was a lot of sort of sharing of tradition and knitwear between Shetland and Norway because of the resistance movement in Norway and the um, just the relationship between those two places. So at any rate, I definitely encourage you to check out the patterns yourself. They are all on Ravelry and you can view the photos there. Um, but like I said, it's worth it. If you like this kind of historical information, um, you're going to love these essays as much as I did. And it's absolutely worth getting the book. Um, it's an investment book. I know that. But it's worth it. So I want to come back to what I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago. Just a few months after I attended Susan's talk in Edinburgh in 2016, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she was very open about her cancer diagnosis and treatment throughout, both the ups and the downs and the toll it took on her. She eventually completed treatment and is now cancer free and eventually obviously finished the book. Um, but I just wanted to share a little bit of what she wrote in her introduction. She said, in July 2016, a diagnosis of stage 3 breast cancer and the subsequent invasive and debilitating treatment and surgery brought me to a grinding halt and forced me to reassess. This 18-month battle to rid myself of cancer has in many ways given me time to look at the project from a new perspective. It has enabled me to face my own insecurities and low self-esteem and recover from an unnerving period of writer's block. Just like the stories and the knitwear woven together on these pages, the project and my own life have become forever intertwined, and the completion of the book also feels like closure on my own battle against this life-threatening disease. I had an immense amount of respect for Susan Crawford before I met her in 2016. I have an immeasurable amount of love and respect for her now. Um, even though my own mother is a cancer survivor, I can't imagine what it was like for Susan to go through this, and the fact that she still managed to finish to finish this eight-year-long project, um, coming out the other side of her illness, to absolutely knock it out of the park, even. Um, it means she should really be commended. Susan, if you're watching this, I think you're so incredible. Um, yeah, I just... what can I say? <laughs> If you're interested in learning more about this book and hearing more of Susan's story, Fruity Knitting did an interview with her a couple of months ago that I will link to in the description box as well, and I definitely encourage you to check it out. We are staying in the first half of the 20th century because next up is a book that plays a large role in the history of Norwegian knitting. Um, in 1929, a book was published by Almaken Sibbenbun called Norske Strikkemønstre, or Norwegian Knitting Designs. Um, ben traveled around Norway in the 1920s collecting motifs, and she assembled them in a book as a way to preserve Norwegian knitting heritage. Um, my version is a version from 2011. It's a new edition of the 1965 English translation, uh, and this version also has a foreword by Terry Shea, whose name will come up a little bit later as well. So this doesn't have the same beautiful cover as the original, but it does have the contents, and that's what matters. This isn't a very big book. It's a pretty slim little volume, and it's effectively just a stitch dictionary. Um, but part of what makes it a big deal is that, as far as I know, it was the first of its kind in Norway, and I love that it has this place in Norwegian history. Uh, when you go to the Norske Folk Museum, the Folk Museum in Oslo, and you get to the room with all of the knitting in it, they have a, an original copy of the Norwegian version of this book in a display case, and I freaked out a little bit when I saw it. It, it gets a big deal. So as far as what you get on the inside, it's a lot of basically charts and things like that. This version in particular has a couple of very simple patterns in the back, um, but you'll want to know something about how to put together a garment if you are going to plan to use it. Um, there's not a lot of writing, it is mostly the charts, but there is one part that I like that I wanted to share with you. She writes, Be careful of color combinations. When in doubt, remember that black and white are always attractive. 
with perhaps a touch of bright red, blue, or green. That's Norwegian knitting tradition in a nutshell. I believe this book is still available from Terry Shea. I will have a link below if so, um, because this is the main way for English speakers to get a hold of this book if you're interested in it. Sticking with Norwegian knitting history for a minute, I want to talk about Anna Morsenbe. I own several of her books and I could have grabbed any of them to show you. I met Amalore at the Nordic Knitting Conference in Seattle in 2012 uh, when I took a mitten class with her and she was also the keynote speaker that year on the Saturday evening. Amalore is a Norwegian textile historian with a really interesting story and I think if you're interested in Norwegian knitting history, Amalore is your lady. So part of why Amalore is interesting is that she wanted some experience in a textile mill um, and went to the owner of a shoddy mill and he agreed to train her but only if she bought the mill from him so she did um so if you don't know what a shoddy mill is shoddy is it's like the opposite of when your ball of yarn says that it's virgin wool virgin wool means that that wool has come from the sheep and been spun into yarn and it's never been used before. Um, shoddy is the opposite. So you take old textiles and you take them to the shoddy mill and you recycle them to be spun into new um, yarns or woven into new materials to create, you know, bed linens or insulation or different things from recycled wool in this case. So that's shoddy. So one of the things that happened when Anamor bought a shoddy mill is that she inherited the rag pile. And what that means in Norway is that she inherited lots and lots of hand knits that are telling a story of Norwegian textile history, hand knitting history. So this is the foundation that her work as a textile historian was originally built on. And I think that's absolutely fascinating because she has so many examples at her disposal to point at or examine or use as evidence of one theory or another or something like that. So like I said, Anmod has several books, and lucky for us, most of them are available in both Norwegian and English. Um, I think there's one or two that are in Norwegian only. She's a book about the Spelsau type of sheep that's only in Norwegian. But for the most part, her books are available in English, and you can order them directly from her if they're still available. But the one I grabbed to show you is called Setestal Sweaters, and it gives you an idea of what she's all about. You might recognize this sweater as a very Norwegian sort of thing. Um, so this book is about the history of the Norwegian lice pattern, as we call it, Lusikofta. So this is a book that contains a lot of history, a lot of imagery, um, and it's just a really interesting read if this is a sweater that you've been interested in and you want to know about. You know, this is absolutely classic and it's what you know sort of the dolda of Norway sweaters are based on. I don't believe this book in particular actually has patterns in it but it does have several uh, sort of charts with variations of different set to doll designs um, based on examples that Anamor has found in her rag pile uh, and in some cases she's even pointing to who they actually belonged to. So some of Anamor's other books are Everyday Knitting, Treasures from a Rag Pile, Invisible Threads in Knitting, um, and Knitting and Art. Knitting and Art was actually the first book of hers that I purchased, and that one's really fascinating because she looks at Norwegian knitting history through art history in a way. Um, so sort of looking at paintings as a representation of daily life and what knitwear looks like over the past you know, 200 years and that you know, kind of thing. If you ever have a chance to go and hear Anamor speak at an event or teach or anything like that, um, she's such a fun person and she's so engaging and she knows so much. So even if you don't pick up one of her books, I would say definitely try and, uh, you know, go to a class or go to a talk if you ever have the chance. Next, I'm going to talk about Kate Davies. Now, I've been a fan of Kate's for a very long time. I first started reading her blog back when it was just a WordPress site called Needled. Um, I knit her owl sweater back in 2009. It was the second sweater I ever knit. And I just adore her work. Um, one of the reasons that I love Kate is that she brings her academic background to her work, um, both on her blog and on her books. Uh, and as someone who's had an academic path myself, I really appreciate that. Her curiosity for history and information is a little bit contagious. And she's an excellent writer who always presents new information in a really engaging way. 
So I grabbed just one of her books as an example. Uh, this is The West Highland Way, which was published earlier this year. Um, it's a book of patterns, as her books usually are, but in this particular book, each pattern is paired with an explanatory essay. Every design is inspired in some way by the West Highland Way in Scotland, which Kate and her husband Tom um, happen to live on. And if you take the time to read this book, you'll learn a lot about the West Highland Way and certain aspects of its history. Uh, you may have guessed based on my feelings about the Vintage Shetland Project, but I really love it when knitting pattern books also involve um, writing that delves into the history or the inspiration of the designs within the book. I think it makes for a really rich experience and I've learned so much from Kate about textile history over the years, particularly in the UK. So many of Kate's other books are like The West Highland Way in that they're a book of Kate's designs based around the theme, and then the book also includes writing on that theme. So some of her others are Colors of Shetland, Buhuya, Inspired by Ila, and Yokes. And I actually had the opportunity to contribute to Yokes in one small way um, when Kate reached out about some information she was trying to hunt down on Norwegian Yokes. So it was pretty fun to see my name at the end of that chapter. If you enjoy Kate's blog, chances are good that you already own one of her books because her writing is so wonderful. Additionally, her husband Tom um, is the photographer for her books, and he's a wonderful photographer, so I think it's a pretty winning combination. Kate's books are available through her own web store, and I know she also distributes two yarn stores, so if your local yarn store doesn't have her books in stock, you can see if they're interested in getting them. On the subject of combining history with patterns, I have another unique book to talk about. Poems of Color by Wendy Kiel is about Bohus knitting from Sweden. Bohus Stickning was a Swedish knitwear company um, in the Bohusland province around Gothenburg. It was originally founded as a way to provide relief work for local women during the Depression in the 1930s and 1940s. And it ran until, I want to say, 1968. Um, it was founded by Emma Jakobsen, who was the wife of the governor of the province at the time. Um, and it was something that grew to become a successful women-led business um, that created beautiful finished pieces, like ready-to-wear finished pieces of knitwear, uh, and it supported the hand knitters who made those pieces. There were several designers, also women, who shaped the aesthetic of Bohus as a company, and the thing that I think they're most known for today, which you can see on the cover here, is their very intricate, fine gauge um, colorwork yokes with textural stitches incorporated and usually an angora blend yarn. So these were luxury items that they were creating. So this is an absolutely fascinating story in knitting history and one I really like to talk about when I get into discussion with other knitters about what the word tradition can mean. Um, because we can talk about the Bohus tradition, but we're using that word a little differently than when I talk about Fair Isle tradition or Norwegian knitting traditions or that kind of thing. Um, but at any rate, this book tells the story of that tradition or that company, um, and it also includes patterns to make some of these iconic designs from Bohus Stickning. Uh, and part of why this one is so cool is that it was the first time that many of these designs were accessible to knitters outside of Sweden or even modern knitters in general. So that one's a really interesting book. So now I want to move on to mittens for a minute. This book, of all the books I'm talking about in this video, is the most recent addition to my collection, so I don't know it as well. But it is um, originally published in Latvian, so this is Mittens of Latvia. It's the English translation. It's by Marita Grazlane, and she is um, an expert in Latvian national costumes and things like that. So she spent several years doing research at the National History Museum of Latvia looking at examples of mittens, and she's picked um, 178 yes, 178 pairs to include in this book. And that spans from the 18th century up to the early 20th century. So she really was aiming to pick a representative selection of mittens that would give kind of a snapshot of different parts of Latvia. So Latvia is broken up into five main regions and the book is organized along those five regional lines as well. So, so when you go to the table of contents, you can look and you can see the five names. I'm not going to try and pronounce them because I don't speak Latvian at all. Um, but two of the regions are even broken up into smaller subregions. So she's really interested in different regional variations in mittens between different parts of Latvia. Um, and that's a really interesting way to look at it. There is informational text um, at the beginning of the book and at the beginning of each section um, following 
so there's some interesting history to read about, but most of the book is made up of the mittens themselves. And this is where the format of this book comes in. You can see it's very long and skinny um, and thick. But what you get when you have a page with a mitten is the chart for the mitten on one side and a photograph of the mitten on the other. I'm not going to go too close on the chart, but that's what one of the photographs looks like. And I think this is a really unique way to present different mitten designs, and I, I think it works really, really well. So while the mitten charts don't necessarily have like, corresponding written patterns with instructions, you do have enough information to be able to knit the mittens based on the chart itself and the information at the bottom, which gives a stitch count for the width of one side of the mitten. So you can knit mittens from this book. You just probably want to have some idea of how to put a mitten together to begin with. Even if you don't read about the history, the inspiration that this book has alone, the colors used are so beautiful. I'm really happy to finally have added this one to my collection. Sticking with mittens, but moving to Norway. This book is basically the Bible of Salbe Mittens. This is Salbe Vota by Anna Borsgård. And this is another hefty tome that's full of absolutely meticulous research and a staggering amount of information. Currently, this book is only available in Norwegian, um, but Alma has confirmed that an English translation is on the way, hopefully in 2019. So I will leave a link to her page in the description box below if you're interested in following that to see when the English translation becomes available. But Alma was motivated by a desire to document the diversity and variation that was found in Salva knitting over the last 150 years. And she worked with the Svadesborg Trondelag uh, Folkmuseum to uh, make this happen. And there's also a corresponding exhibition of mittens, like physical mittens, that's been traveling around Norway since the publication of this book. Um, this book is chock full of different charts and photos, and it also has um, 40 different patterns in the back with silver mittens and gloves from tiny children's sizes up to big men's hands. Um, but for me, I love this book for the history. So Anna has managed to recount sort of the history of the Selba style of knitting this iconic black and white with these traditional motifs and all. I mean, what we think of now as tradition, right? Um, so she's told the story of the history and she also sort of walks you through the anatomy of a Selba mitten and what the components are that make it a Selba mitten and how it was knit and how it's knit today and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so she includes a lot of information. That being said, even though this book is only available in Norwegian right now, you'll still get a lot out of it, even if you don't speak Norwegian. Like I said, there's lots of charts, lots of photos, um, just to give you an idea. I mean, it's it's absolutely, it's, it's an inspiration. So if you're interested in mittens, um, I think you'll probably still be really interested in this book. But if you want the information and the research as well, it's probably worth holding out for the English translation. Or you could get both, but that gets a little expensive. Um, in any case, this was a book that came out when I lived in Norway and it was everywhere. And at first, because it was expensive, I just took it out from the library, but then I left Norway and you can't just go to the library in Montreal and find this book, I don't think. So I finally invested in a copy and it's just, it's so beautiful. But two more things on the topic of Selby mittens. Um, I mentioned Terry Shea a few minutes ago when I was talking about Anakin Sibbon Bun's book. Um, and while Terry doesn't have anything to do with Alma's book, Terry does have a book that's kind of about Selby mittens. Uh, it's called Selby Wotter Biography of a Knitting Tradition. I think I have a copy, but it's at work, so I don't have it with me to show you. Unlike Alma's book, Terry's mitten patterns aren't necessarily based on mittens from Selby itself. Um, her book is made up of mittens from two primary, primary sources, I think. One of those sources is the rag pile of Anmar Sundbe, who I've already mentioned. Um, so those are mittens that were at the Shadi Mail in southern Norway, which is a different part of Norway than Selbu. And the other source of mittens was the Nordic Museum in Seattle, which is a museum I absolutely love. If you're ever in Seattle, you should go to the new Nordic Museum. They have a beautiful new building. But they have, they have their own archive of stuff that isn't on display in the museum. So the Nordic Museum had a collection of mittens and Terry picked the mittens from that as well. So with those mittens, 
they could have come from Norway originally, but they were donated by um, usually Norwegian Americans. So they might have been mittens that came from the immigrants, but they also could have been made in America after immigration by Norwegian Americans, which is also super interesting, but it's a little bit different than what Alma's done. So it's still, Terry's book is a, it's a nice book of patterns if you're interested in Selba mittens. She's got mittens and gloves and all kinds of things in that book, but it is a much smaller book with a lot less information in it than Alma's book. The second thing I wanted to mention if you're interested in Selba mittens, you may have noticed these hanging back here. I tapped them a minute ago. These are my wooden mitten blockers made by Patricia Aaron of Knitography, um, or you might know her as P. Fortune on Instagram. And part of why Patricia got to making those blockers was this book. So Patricia lives um, in the same region of Norway as where these mittens come from, and she was interested in creating a traditional tool for finishing and getting mittens ready for sale that was no longer available. Um, and what she's trying to do with her blockers is to really recreate this traditional tool. And I can tell you as someone who's knit a lot of mittens this year, that these blockers have really upped my game. They make your mittens look absolutely beautiful. So um, again, if you're interested in mittens, you should check those out. I'll link to Patricia below as well. I'm losing my natural light here, so I'm gonna try and finish up quickly. I have two more books to talk about by the same author. So that's these. Um, this is the Knit Sonic Stranded Colorwork source book. This one came first, and it was followed by the Knit Sonic Stranded Colorwork playbook. Um, these are by Felicity Ford, also known as Felix, um, and you might know her as Knit Sonic on social media. I first heard about Felix because she's a friend of Kate Davies, and she would pop up on Kate's blog from time to time, and I purchased the Stranded Colorwork source book when it came out several years ago, and it just got me so excited. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that book first. So Felix is in the UK. She's based in Reading, I believe, and she is interesting to me for a number of reasons. Um, Knit Sonic, you might be able to guess that she's also interested in sound a little bit, uh, as well as the knitting. Um, and she's done some sound art and she's combined both of those things. And she's just a really interesting person. Felix loves stranded color work and she loves to play with stranded color work. And what this book did was it introduced what she calls the Knit Sonic method. And the Knit Sonic method is a way of using everyday life to create inspiration for stranded color work patterns. So I'm gonna give you some examples. So here's Felix's little um, map for what the method looks like. So you start with your inspiration source. You move on to picking your palette, looking for the colors that you're gonna use. Um, you start coming up with patterns. So that's actually starting to draw your charts and things like that. Then you move on to shading, swatching, review, finish and block. So once you have your inspiration and your palette and you start to chart your motifs based on that inspiration, then you take the palette and apply it you know, with shading and things like that. So the idea is to, to come up with um, a pattern that speaks to you because it evokes something about your source inspiration in some way. So Felix has some examples in this book. So in her chapter on things, there's a few different things in her life that she found inspiration from. So one of them is a little biscuit tin. And then we have a book about electricity, this book here. So these are both things in her life that she used to come up with palettes of colors. So here's her biscuit tin again. And the book about electricity. So once she had her palette, she started sketching up charts and coming up with motifs. And from there, she could start to apply the colors from her palette to the charts and start swatching. And this shows a little bit of her swatch that she came up with based on the biscuit tin. And this one, oh, I love this one. This one is the swatch based on her book about electricity. So that's a little glimpse at sort of the process that she's guiding you through in this book. Um, 
But I also find it really interesting to read about her own inspiration and the things and the places and, and the, the different sources she's used as examples because she lives in a very different place than I do and has a very different life. So her sources of inspiration are very different. Um, and I think it's fascinating to be able to see that. But she really guides you through this process in multiple different ways with multiple different examples. And it's such a cool way to get creative with color work. So with her Nitsonic method, you basically end up with a swatch. And once you have a swatch that you like or some part of your swatch that you like, you can use that to apply that to garments or wearable items. And she does have a basic set of instructions for sort of how to incorporate what you like from your swatch into something like a pair of arm warmers or a scarf or things like that. And to help you do that, she does include a pattern for some fingerless mitts. So part of what I love about this book is that Felix just really encourages you to play with your knitting and to treat stranded color work as another creative expression. And as a book, I've never come across anything that is quite like this one. So it's a really unique addition to a color work library. So she followed it up with the stranded color work playbook, which is this one. And it kind of took all the ideas from the source book and it took that method and it just took it all up a notch. I'm also now running out of battery, but I just wanted to say that the playbook takes it up a notch and it's a wonderful resource. Felix really brings celebration to everyday knitting and it's part of what I like about her so much. Okay, you guys, I am losing both the natural daylight and my batteries. I'm gonna call it there. If you have any questions about any of the books I've shared in this video, please comment down below and I will do my best to respond quickly. Um, if you have color egg books you love that I didn't talk about, please share those as well. I would love to hear about them and I think everybody else would as well. I do not have a regular upload schedule, so if you want to know when new videos go live, please feel free to subscribe and you will see new videos pop up in your subscription box. Um, but I do have some more videos planned for you guys and I'm really excited to get back into the swing of this. So if there's certain things that you'd like to hear, I'm always curious about that as well. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you very soon.